Good afternoon. The first item of business is portfolio questions. I call the first question, Linda Habiani. I see you now. Mr. Habiani. <laughs> to ask the Scottish Government when it will next meet the UK Government to discuss matters relating to the Constitution. Uh, Michael Russell. Uh, presiding officer, yesterday I met with UK Government Ministers along with my counterpart in the Welsh Government, Mark Drakeford, and civil servants from the Northern Ireland Executive in the Joint Ministerial Committee on EU Negotiations. The meeting focused on UK frameworks, the EU withdrawal bill, migration, and the involvement of the devolved administrations in stage two of the EU negotiations. I made clear that the constitutional future of Scotland and this parliament is very much at stake in the process of EU withdrawal, unless there are amendments to the withdrawal bill. I stress that all the powers of this parliament affected by withdrawal must stay devolved after Brexit. I also made clear that if it is possible to create a special arrangement between Northern Ireland and the European Union, recognising the special difficulties and status of Northern Ireland, then there is no logical reason why Scotland should not have the same rights. And indeed, it would be unacceptable for Scotland to be placed at any economic disadvantage. Linda Fabiani. Uh, will the Minister, next time he meets with his UK counterparts, following on from these discussions in yesterday's debate, express the shock of many in Scotland to find out that under the EU withdrawal bill, they are refusing to safeguard Scotland's devolution settlement, but instead legislated for the right to amend the Scotland Act 1998, along with Tory Scottish MPs who consistently refused to safeguard Scotland's interests. Minister. Well, it, it was disappointing last week to, to see those um, Tory Scottish MPs refusing to support uh, the Scottish Government and Welsh Government amendments, carefully thought through amendments with regard to Clause 11. Uh, and then last night to see a, re a repeat of that situation in which Amendment 158 was voted down, uh, an amendment that would have made sure that uh, UK ministers could not, by um, secondary legislation or by action, simply by a stroke of a pen, uh, alter legislation passed through this parliament. Uh, and it is disappointing to see that. We have made it absolutely clear that we will not bring forward a legislative consent motion unless there are these amendments or similar amendments, equivalent amendments to the bill. Uh, and uh, that is the number of the matter. And there can be no legislative consent motion without those significant and lasting changes to the bill. Adam Tompkin. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Herald today reports on its front page that at yesterday's JMC there was in fact substantial agreement between the two governments on the repatriation of powers from the European Union to this Parliament following Brexit. Yet, according to the Herald, rather than share this good news with the Scottish Parliament and indeed with the Scottish people, the SNP would rather keep it under wraps. Why? Doesn't this just serve to underscore yet again that the SNP would rather contrive a grievance than get on with the job of delivering Brexit for Scotland? Minister. Uh, no, it doesn't. I mean, uh, if you'd read the whole, if, uh, if Mr. Tompkins had read the whole piece, he would have seen a significant statement from the Scottish Government which said, this is not true. So the exclusive tag on the story is an exclusive untrue story. Uh, what is more, I think, concerning about this story is it indicates that the Secretary of State for Scotland does not understand uh, the process in which he is engaged, which is very concerning indeed. The process in which we are engaged is to look at a list of 111 intersections between European competence and Scottish, uh, uh, de devolved Scottish competence and make sure that those matters come to this Parliament. Then, of course, and we've made it absolutely clear, we can sit down and talk about those matters that should be subject to joint frameworks, uh, co-decision co making. It is not, unless, unless this is a new declaration of intent from the UK government, it is not about re-reserving powers that should be in this Parliament. But if Mr. Mundell's uh, briefing to the Herald is to be taken at face value, he believes the actions that we're engaged in is about re-reserving powers and allowing the rest to come back here. That is at the nub of the matter. And if the Secretary of State for Scotland does not understand the discussion we had yesterday afternoon, then it bodes ill to get a settlement. Fortunately, there are others around the table in the UK government who do understand it, who are working to try and achieve this. And I do hope that that work will pay off. But I have to say, it is not helped by the Secretary of State for Scotland, who seems to think his job is to brief the Herald rather than get a resolution. Question two, Bill Bowman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it will compensate for decreasing levels of landfill tax revenues as the amount of waste to landfill decreases. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. As an environmental tax designed to divert material from landfill, 
encourage alternative waste treatment options and keep valuable resources circulating in our economy for longer, I would see declining landfill tax revenue as a positive trend. It's also worth noting that the adjustment to the Scottish Government's block grants relating to landfill tax is also forecast to fall, which means that overall falling revenues do not necessarily lead to less spending power. Bill Bowman. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Will Scottish rates for landfill tax continue to mirror UK rates or will they diverge? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, as we were discussing over dinner last night, Mr Bowman, I don't know whose uh, reputation that does more damage to you or, or mine, um, very complex nature of the block grant adjustment. I actually hope that both across the UK and in Scotland, landfill tax revenues go down because that will be an indicator that we're making progress in our environmental ambitions and that will be good for the environment as well as for the economy. Question three, Ross Greer. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it will ensure that sufficient funding is provided to local authorities to help them meet the needs of their residents. Cabinet Secretary. The 2018-19 budget will continue to treat local government fairly despite the cuts to the Scottish budget from the UK Government. It is then the responsibility of individual local authorities to manage their own budgets and to allocate the total financial resources available to them on the basis of local needs and priorities. Ross Greer. Thank you. East Remshire Council in my region are proposing in their coming budget to cut all classroom assistance in their primary and secondary schools and significantly reduce the number of behavioural support assistants. I accept that if I ask the Cabinet Secretary what will be in tomorrow's budget, that he'll ask me to wait till tomorrow, but does he accept that without a significant change in policy from the Scottish Government, cuts like this become impossible to avoid for councils? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I've just glanced at the figures, of course, for uh, East Dumbartonshire and last uh, year, or this... Uh, uh, East Remshire, I've looked at that as well. That's how uh, multi-talented I am. So I looked at Eastern Bartonshire thinking that Ross Greer would have an interest in that. And its increase was over 4%. East Remshire's was over 5%. So uh, in, in every regard, both councils have done very well from our settlement to uh, local government. Incidentally, both councils increased their uh, council tax using their powers uh, also. Touching on education is a really important point. I think the pupil equity funding and the wider attainment funding has supported uh, young people and pupils across the country resulting in more teachers being employed uh, as well addressing that crucial uh, attainment uh, gap uh, but I can uh, reassure uh, Ross Greer that the uh, local government settlement that I'll propose uh, will be fair uh, and reasonable and he answered his own question full details will be released tomorrow. John Mason. Thank you. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that uh, allocation of funding to councils will continue to be based on need and there won't be a kind of evening out process which might disadvantage the islands and Glasgow and those with greater needs? Cabinet Secretary. There's a very sophisticated uh, needs-based formula for the local government settlement which is arrived at in dialogue with uh, uh, local government, uh, with uh, COSLA. Uh, that said, there's also the floor, another technical arrangement that allows for stability and a degree of convergence around funding. But fundamentally, the answer is yes. The funding settlement for local government continues to be needs-based. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Audit Scotland's recent report confirmed that local government funding from the Scottish Government had fallen in real terms by 7.6% since 10-11 demonstrating that the Scottish Government has enforced disproportionate cuts to local government. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that since next year's block grant will again increase in real terms, there is no further justification for cuts to local government by this SNP Government? Cabinet Secretary. Well, you know, I, I don't know what's going on in the parallel universe that is aligned <laughs> Alexander Stewart's mind with the rest of the Tories in their briefing notes. Look, the reality is that the resource funding for day-to-day -day spending for the Scottish Government is going down. It's going down by £200 million next year, half a billion pounds over two years. Don't just take my word for it. The Fraser of Allender Institute says so. And in terms of the previous period, it's also the case that our budget's been going down. It's gone down by £2.6 billion. Pounds. That's 8% in real terms. And over that period, we have protected local government as best we can. South of the border, where the Conservatives have been in control, the real terms reductions to local authorities in England has been over 20%, showing that we have treated local government in Scotland very fairly indeed. Question four, Lewis MacDonald. 
To ask the Scottish Government how it will ensure fair and adequate funding for all of Scotland's local authorities. Cabinet Secretary. The 2018-19 draft budget will continue to treat local government fairly despite the cuts to the Scottish budget from the UK Government. Local government allocations are distributed using a needs-based formula which is kept under constant review and agreed with COSLA. Lewis MacDonald. Cabinet, I thank the Cabinet Secretary. He'll recognise that that funding formula, which you referred to previously, has tended to disadvantage certain councils, including, for example, the City of Aberdeen, and that provision has been made in the previous Parliament through the floor funding, which you referred to in reply to Mr Mason, through that floor funding to reduce that disadvantage. Is he able to confirm today that that funding floor is set to continue? Uh, and will it now achieve the target of 85% of the Scottish average, which was set for it some years ago? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Lewis MacDonald is right to say that there is the needs-based formula, there's the ability for councils to raise council tax. Then on top of that, uh, for Aberdeen, there has been an 85% floor. Something, incidentally, that the Labour Party never gave to Aberdeen or the North East when they were in power, but it has been... Uh, it has been established by this SNP government, and I'm sure that Lewis MacDonald, as will many other members of the chamber, welcome the local government settlement when they see it tomorrow. Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Given that the Scottish Parliament Information Centre have confirmed that the Scottish government's budget is going up in real terms from this year to next, given that yesterday, when they published their economic commentary, Fraser of Allender said, notwithstanding the Cabinet Secretary's comments that the Scottish Government's budget is going up in real terms over the next three years. The total budget is going up over the next three uh, yeah. years. Yeah. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree there is no case to make any further real terms cuts to local government spending? Yeah. Can, I just remind, can I just remind members, Mr Fries, I don't like props. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, appropriately rebuked, I would say, uh, presiding officer. Um, the prop that Murdo Fraser has chosen to use is, is one such prop. I don't know why they want to ignore and dismiss the advice of the Fraser of Allender Institute. Are you suggesting that the Fraser of Allender Institute, in terms of what they've said around discretionary spend, so that's the resource for day-to-day -day public services. That's what funds schools and hospitals and police and fire and frontline local government services. I know Murdo Fraser is far more intelligent than he's pretending to be in this chamber this afternoon. And Murdo Fraser, like the rest of the Conservatives, know only too well you've cut that discretionary funding to Scotland. That's the reality, but the Tory briefing note doesn't say so. So just like Pavlov's dogs, they <laughs> follow this merry tune that we've got extra resources when in fact when in fact our resources for frontline discretionary spend has gone down by 200 million pounds next year and half a billion pounds over two years can i remind members that this will be debated this afternoon so <laughs> we don't have to reprise it all now can i have question five please from jeremy balfour Thank you, Deputy President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the UK Government's decision to do so, whether it will bring forward the linking of non domestic rate poundage to CPI from April 2018 to 2020. Cabinet Secretary. That's a good question, and I'll give you the answer tomorrow in the draft budget. Jeremy Balfour. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary <laughs> for his very full answer? Um, Lincoln Pound, or would you agree with me that Lincoln poundage to CPI? would result in rates being more than a penny lower in just three years' time, saving the average shop hundreds of pounds in tax. In an age of increasing competition from online retailers, doesn't the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that we need to do all we can do to help our struggling shops on the high street? Cabinet Secretary. I certainly agree with the sentiment of the question, and a number of businesses have made this switch from RPI to CPI as the main ask eh, of the budget tomorrow. And the Barclay Review also said that there is an argument to move from RPI to CPI, but in Barclay's view, it was at this stage uh, unaffordable. Uh, but certainly I have been reflecting on that in many other matters. And I say again to the member uh, that I present my proposals to Parliament uh, tomorrow. Willie Coffey. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you what proportion of rateable properties do not pay rates as a result of the small business bonus? 
And can you confirm that those businesses that qualify for that scheme will continue to benefit from it next year? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as it stands today, about half of all properties in Scotland pay uh, no rates whatsoever. 40% of all properties, uh, that's a consequence of small business bonus. And I've said that the small business bonus will continue. Neil Finlay. My understanding is that we're supposed to be in an era of evidence-led policy. Can I ask the uh, Cabinet Secretary uh, for Finance when he will have a proper independent analysis of the small business bonus? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I believe that the small business bonus has been a, a lifeline, particularly to our town centres across Scotland, in ensuring that smaller businesses have that, that relief in what has been quite turbulent times. Indeed, when I it launched uh, the last uh, budget in terms of non-domestic rates, the, the property I visited in Paisley was using the relief that they were now entitled to, to employ another young person. Surely Neil Finlay would welcome that kind of initiative delivered through the small business bonus. At number six, David Stewart. Uh, <coughs> thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what representations it received from local authorities regarding the draft budget. Cabinet Secretary. Ahead of my 2018-19 draft budget announcement, I've met with a number of individual council leaders and had a series of meetings with COSLA. David Stewart. President officer, many local authorities within my region are facing severe financial pressures and unique rural and logistic demands. My own local council, Highland, have responsibility for 6,752 kilometres of local roads, 17,000 footpaths and 1,400 bridges. And that's not counting the new Home Mills Bridge, which opened on Monday. Will the Cabinet Secretary look again at the Scottish Government's funding formula and give more leeway to rural local authorities, which cover great swathes of Scotland, such as Highland? Cabinet Secretary. I would only consider a change to the formula if uh, COSLA, i.e. local government, wanted me to. Would that not be welcomed by members in the chamber who yeah. believe in partnership and engagement with local authorities? They determine the funding formula. There is partnership working on it, and I don't propose to change that. Of course, if I did more for rural areas, urban councils would say there's an argument around deprivation, and every council, all 32 out of 32 council leaders, could present a case on how the formula could be changed to suit them. But that's why we do it collectively, in partnership, I propose to maintain that structure and incidentally Highland Council as an example of course if you look at the totality of resources to support local services also enjoyed a real terms increase in the current financial year. Question 7, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government by how much PFI PPP payments will increase in 2018-19 given such payments and index linked bonds include charges that increase with inflation. Cabinet Secretary. The total estimated PFI unitary charge payments for 2018-19 will increase by almost £19 million, taking the total figure for that year to over a £1 billion. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does he agree that inflation again exacerbates the year-on-year -year increases in charges, showing the folly of Labour, Lib Dem and Tory support for PFI? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, it certainly is a burden that we have to live with, uh, pay for, and that's why our financial models have been much better for the public person for quality public services. Jackie Bailey. Of the unitary charge payments applied to PFI PPP and, of course, to NPD projects brought forward by the SNP government. Last week, the Public Audit Committee took evidence from the Scottish Government and the Scottish Futures Trust about changes to the classification of capital projects as a result of ESA 10. We now know that the Scottish Government has to borrow almost £1 billion to cover these projects which are now on balance sheet. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my concern that this is an opportunity lost and other capital projects have been delayed as a consequence? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, absolutely not true and I look forward to setting out to setting out a very exciting, bold and ambitious and transformative capital investment programme tomorrow. I'll take uh, a very short one from Ivan McKee, question eight. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to ensure that departmental spend is delivered in the most effect, delivering the most effective outcomes in terms of the National Performance Framework Indicators. Cabinet Secretary. That's... Beg thank, your pardon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister. National Performance Framework sets out the Government's priorities. The programme for Government sets out the actions that the Scottish Government will take over the next year to progress these priorities, and the draft budget sets out the funding arrangements. 
The Scotland Perform website is the reporting tool for the NPF. It provides a continually updated, impartial and transparent stock take across a diverse range of economic, social and environmental indicators. In addition, to support the parliamentary committees in scrutinising the draft budget, we provide performance information to demonstrate the interrelationship between the government's priorities and spending plans. I have Mickey briefly, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the Minister will be aware that the NPF is internationally acknowledged to be a world leading process for measuring success in public service delivery. Does the Minister agree with me that can time to ensure the link between public sector spend and delivery of measurable performance is both the right approach and in accord with the principles determined by the Christie Commission? Minister. Yes, I do. <coughs> Well, there's brevity for you. Now move on to questions on economy, jobs and fair work. I call number one, has not been lodged for reasons explained. Uh, number two, Fulton McGregor, please. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports local authorities in attracting businesses and jobs to town centres. Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to revitalising our town centres by stimulating inclusive economic growth and supporting opportunities to attract investment. We're working with local authorities to deliver plans which attract a range of businesses and services to town centres, and this is supported by a number of initiatives, including Town Centre Action Plan, which is helping to stimulate a wide range of activity in our town centres, and the Town Centre, town centre Action Plan two years on report was published in February of 2016. Two centre, uh, town Centre First uh, Principle, which recognises that town centre locations are not always a suitable location, but ask that the rationale for locating projects or investments elsewhere is evidenced and transparent. And Scotland's Towns Partnership, which has been funded to facilitate activity and share and promote learning from activity happening at a local level. In addition, the Scotland's business rates package is the most attractive in the UK, with total rates relief of around £660 million in the current financial year and over 100,000 premises benefiting from small business bonus scheme, including over 4,000 in North Lanarkshire. Fulton McGregor. I thank the Minister for that response. Just last week I held the second in my series of town centre regeneration meetings for Cope Bridge Town Centre. There is a lot of goodwill towards the town centre and a strong desire for it to thrive again, but no single stakeholder seems to have the levers or strategy to make all the necessary changes. Can the government advise what measures are in place to help communities, including local authorities, elected representatives, parliamentarians, local businesses, community groups, private owners and other stakeholders to form strategy, strategy groups interested in working together to improve town centres. Can I just remind everyone it's useful to have short questions and sort of succinct answers, if I may. Yes, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, well, in, in response to Fulton McGregor, clearly, obviously, the, I know the Parliament uh, the, the has a cross-party group which focuses on these issues, but aside from that, sort of one way in which parliamentarians can engage in the agenda, but uh, I referred to it briefly, Scotland, in my original answer. Scotland's Towns Partnership is an excellent source of advice and information for uh, newly established uh, strategy groups identifying the next steps for town centre improvements. And we have established uh, STP as the go-to body for all town centre activity in Scotland, as we recognise the need for dedicated support uh, for town centres. And this town centre toolkit, which is hosted on the STP's website, gives communities information and advice on how they can make their own town centres more attractive, active and accessible. And strategy groups may also wish to use the Understanding Scottish Places or USP data tool. And that is an online platform, again, designed to help users better understand the function of towns in the, in the modern era and provides the opportunity to compare and contrast towns across Scotland to learn from good practice. I don't know what succinct means anymore. I call Dean Lockhart, please. I will try my best, uh, Deputy President Officer. Uh, I note the series of measures explained by the Minister. Can he explain why does Scotland have the highest number of empty shops in the UK? Could it be business rates? Could it be the large business supplement? Minister. Well, clearly, um, we, we've referred to that we have a competitive um, business rates package in Scotland, and we are taking every effort, as has been demonstrated by the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, to listen uh, to representations made to the Barclay Review to tailor the rates package we have. Obviously, the budget tomorrow will set out more detail of the government's plans to support businesses at a local level, uh, but we have a wide range of, of, of tools in, in our uh, locker to be able to help small businesses. We encourage, uh, and we are encouraging businesses through uh, support for the Enterprise and Skills Review to engage with enterprise agencies and to gain support. But clearly there's a range of uh, measures in which the Scottish Government attempts to help small business uh, and our town centres. And uh, the advice they're given to Mr McGregor and indeed the points that will be set out in the budget tomorrow is a, a, a complete package of support to help small business community. Thank you. Question three, John Mason. Hey, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding European structural funds and regional policy after Brexit. Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, I met David Mundell, Secretary of State for Scotland, on the 7th of December and asked him to confirm the UK Government's position on whether it was committed to supporting deals across Scotland and for engagement on the industrial strategy. I had a discussion with Greg Clark, Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, on the 16th of November. And I also discussed the industrial strategy at the latest Scottish Business Growth Group meeting on the 15th of November with Ian Duncan. As for the European Structural Funding, I met the Economy Se Economic Secretary to the Treasury, Stephen Barclay, on the 6th of October, when I stressed how vital it is that sustainable replacement for the funding is put in place and I will continue to press the UK Government to engage with us so we can deliver the best outcome for Scotland and whatever form these arrangements take the UK Government must provide Scotland with no less than the current level of funding we receive and the autonomy over that funding to align it to Scottish priorities. Thank you. John Mason. Well I commend the Cabinet Secretary on his uh, workload. Uh, I wonder if he'd agree with the Industrial Communities Alliance that older industrial Britain which are just does not just include Scotland, but the north of England and the Midlands and elsewhere, has benefited greatly from these structural funds and would have a real problem if the UK did not continue them. Cabinet Secretary. I do agree with that. There's been £395 million of European structural funding already committed, uh, matched by over £500 million from Scottish partners, giving a total investment of £900 million. And as John Mason says, this is crucial to those communities that he's talked about. And I join many of those who are benefiting from this support on the 29th of November in Edinburgh to celebrate and promote the progress of projects to date. Heard about, for example, Zero Waste Scotland using £30 million in grant to support the resource efficient circular economy accelerator programme, supporting over 2,000 SMEs and the community sector. It includes projects like the uh, one at Sustainable Papa Westray in Orkney to restore a community centre and the little bakery in Dumfries to replace an inefficient bakery oven. Details of the second phase of funding will be announced in the new year. Question four, Marie Goujon. To ask the Scottish Government how it encourages employers to pay at least the living wage to those under 25. Minister. Accredited living wage employers who pay the real living wage are paying this to all staff 18 years and over. In Scotland we have now proportionately more than five times as many accredited living wage employers as in the rest of the UK, which is a testament to this Government's commitment to making Scotland a living wage nation. We are supporting the Poverty Alliance by increasing funding for the Scottish Living Wage Accreditation Initiative to £336,000 this year, and we're working with them and their leadership group to support their efforts to target low-pay sectors. Mary Goujon. I thank the Minister for that answer. Could he also outline what discussions the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government in relation to including those under the age of 25 in the national living wage, given that they continue to be discriminated against by that Government? And could he also outline what actions the Scottish Government is taking forward to support young people into positive destinations, especially in light of the Year of Young People next year? Minister. It will, on the three issues that Mary Goujon has uh, identified, of course, the Scottish Government has ensured that the Scottish Welfare Fund can be used to help uh, young people affected by changes to housing benefit entitlement, which uh, we've uh, opposed. In relation to the, uh, the national living wage, I think the first thing to emphasise, of course, President Officer, is that is a, a contract. It is not a living wage. It is not the living wage set out by the Living Wage Commission. Uh, nonetheless, of course, it being a, a statutory uh, process, this uh, Government has and its uh, uh, responses to the Low Pay Commission set out a proposal to decrease the differential between the youth and apprentice rates and the adult rate. Uh, but of course, we want to see the real living wage, the, the norm across the board. Uh, that's why we set that out as a, a, our proposal to make it a, a statutory a proposition in our general election manifesto. That's why we continue to promote it. Ross Greer. Thank you. Does the Scottish Government require companies to pay the living wage to all workers, regardless of age, if they wish to receive funding from the Scottish Enterprise Agencies? And if not, why not? Minister. Well, we're working actively with our enterprise agencies to make sure that they are playing their part in the promotion of uh, the real uh, living wage. It's uh, an effort that we uh, take very seriously indeed. It's one that we're leading from the front as uh, an administration uh, and it's paying dividends. That's why Scotland has the highest proportion of, the, uh, po of its working age population of any of the UK nations paid uh, the living wage or more. Question five, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to create targets with specific deadlines to reduce the disability employment gap. Minister. In a Fair of Scotland for Disabled People, published in December 2016, the Scottish Government set a target to at least half the disability employment gap. We are working with stakeholders to develop a timetable, along with further actions to be taken to achieve our ambitions for disability employment. We will set out more detail at the Major Congress on Disability Employment in the Workplace planned for early next year. Uh, Mark Griffin. Thank the, the Minister for that answer. Looking ahead to the new devolved services, can I ask what ongoing 
engagement he has had with the third sector since the decision was made to award just 20% of the contracts uh, to bids led, led by the, the public and um, third sector. Is the, the minister assured that the supply chain providers can afford to deliver such uh, a high quality service when the private sector has such a substantial role? Minister. Well, of course, it's the case that uh, our uh, new employment programme, Fair Start Scotland, which will begin in April 2018, is delivered by a range of partners. And contrary to the impression that Mark Griffin uh, has uh, just uh, uh, given to the, the Chamber, uh, when we look at the global value of the contracts awarded, the nine contracts uh, awarded to some 95% of the value of those contracts involve the third sector as, as, either as the main contract holder or a, a delivery agent of a main contract holder. So the third sector has a significant role to play here. Uh, I am confident of that. I'm confident our programme will be a success. And yes, of course, I continue to engage with the third sector and all those who have an interest in ensuring that uh, people get the chance to get employment in Scotland. Blair Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister mentioned the new transitional employability services of the Scottish Government. Workforce Scotland and Work Able Scotland in their first six months have helped over 3,500 disabled people into work. Um, does the Minister agree with me this is both effective and dealing with disabled people in a dignified way? Minister. Well, of course, our ambition has been, uh, Presiding Officer, through our transitional arrangements and our longer term approach to ensure that all people who utilise our employment programmes are treated with dignity and respect, whether, irrespective of whether they have a disability or not. Of course, we set out an ambition of supporting up to 4,800 people uh, into uh, uh, work through our uh, 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 transitional programme uh, this year. And as uh, Claire Adamson has just correctly pointed out, we're halfway through that initiative and already we've had some 3,500 people supported by that effort. Question six, Brian Wood. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to increase workforce productivity. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Scotland's labour productivity growth has outstripped the UK's in recent years. Uh, GDP per hour worked has increased by 6.6% .6 in Scotland since 2007, compared to 0.8% for the UK as a whole. The Scottish Government recognises that improving the productivity of our workforce is a central driver of inclusive economic growth, and that's why we're taking forward a range of programmes, such as our investment in skills, developing the young workforce, addressing inequalities in the workforce, and the Fair Work Agenda. And through the Enterprise and Skills Review, we've also established a clear forward-looking agenda to improve the system of enterprise and skills support in Scotland and make a substantial and valuable contribution, increasing our productivity and broader economic performance. And I would hope that these actions and the progress thus far will be welcomed by the member. Brian Whittle. Can I thank the Cabinet, Minister, uh, Cabinet Secretary for that answer? He, he'll be aware, of course, that the impact of poor physical and mental health has on productivity. Therefore, strategies like the mental health strategy, obesity and diet strategy can have huge implications on the nation's productivity. With that in mind, what input does the Cabinet Secretary's team have across other portfolios? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we have the regular uh, contributions, of course, at uh, Cabinet level amongst Cabinet colleagues and also between uh, ministerial colleagues. Uh, I would say, of course, that the mental health strategy is much more in the portfolio of my uh, colleague uh, Maureen Watt. And any particular questions on that, I'm happy to uh, furnish a member with answers to it. But he can be assured there is regular collaboration between Cabinet ministers and ministers across portfolios. Question seven, John Scott. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and declaring an interest as a farmer to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding establishing schemes that aim to attract more seasonal skilled labour across all sectors to Scotland, such as the former Seasonal Agricultural Workers Scheme. Minister. The UK Government's position on migration post-Brexit is likely to have a major impact on the availability of labour, not just in terms of seasonal skilled workers, but across the board for both high and low skilled jobs. That is one of the reasons why the Scottish Government is lobbying the UK Government hard to maintain membership of the single market with its associated free movement of citizens. Scotland values the contribution that temporary workers in the migrant community make to our economy and we are determined to do what we can to continue with the current arrangements. John Scott. Uh, President, officer, I thank the Minister for his answer. And the Minister is aware that there is an emerging difficulty in attracting skilled labour to work in our food processing, tourism and agricultural sectors, as well as other sectors. How does he intend to address this now clearly defined and growing problem, currently driven by the fall in value of the pound against the euro, which threatens to undermine the future success of our tourism and our food and drink sector? Minister. Well, I have to say I'm rather surprised this question comes from the Conservative benches, given that the great pressure being caused is as a result of their symbolic handling 
of the Brexit process. So as I have set out in my initial answer, we continue uh, to lobby the UK government hard to ensure that we can continue to access the, the skilled uh, labour we will require for economy from uh, elsewhere in Europe. But of course, we, we cannot just rely on that. Uh, we certainly can't rely on the UK government in this regard. And this is a matter I uh, take very seriously. I know it's one that uh, also Fergus Jung is the current Secretary for Rural Economy. It considers it uh, very seriously uh, uh, through engagement between sector skills councils and skills development Scotland. If uh, there is more that can be done to ensure that we have the skilled uh, workforce we need for these sectors, uh, then we will uh, work to, towards that in that, that regard. And uh, I'm seeing some examples of that already. I was up in Argyll and Butte uh, recently, uh, presiding officer, where I saw the local college engaging actively with the agricultural community to make sure that skilled supply of uh, workforce can come through in the future. Question eight, Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, can I offer my apologies for my slightly later arri arrival for the question time, but ask the Scottish Government what immediate action it is taking to support the economies of Orkney and Shetland. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, this Government is committed to promoting economic growth across all of our communities, including those in Orkney and Shetland. Our substantial investment in infrastructure, regeneration and business support helps to deliver inclusive growth and economic resilience, creating and retaining jobs in communities across the Northern Isles. For example, the 2016 SNP manifesto contained a commitment to take action to reduce fares on ferry services to Orkney and Shetland, and this Government is delivering on that commitment, and that is our priority. On the 22nd of August, the Minister for Transport in the Islands announced their intention to introduce reduced passenger and car ferry fares on services from the mainland to Orkney and Shetland in the first half of 2018. The fares options identified in line with the Clyde and Hebrides ferry network are road equivalent tariff on the Pentland Firth routes and a variant of RET on the longer Aberdeen to Kirkwall Lerwick routes. The average reduction in fares across the Northern Isles will be over 30% for cars and 40% for passengers. Lee MacArthur. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for uh, his answer and, and certainly acknowledge and welcome uh, the decision, albeit belated, in relation to uh, cheaper ferry fares on the, the external routes. But as a former Transport Minister, he'll be aware that crucial to the local economies of Orkney and Shetland are our internal ferries, a lifeline to the smaller islands in both constituencies. So, so when will the Scottish Government honour the commitment it made in 2014 to provide fair funding for those lifeline services? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we have, as uh, the member mentions, made that commitment. In fact, it was made as long ago as when I was uh, Transport Minister to directly to uh, the councils involved. And of course, that's been followed through by the Transport Minister. And it's a matter of discussion, I think, both between the Transport Minister and the Finance Cabinet Secretary in relation to the discussions they've had with the relevant local authorities. I think it's right that those discussions are allowed to take place. And of course, uh, the particular needs uh, of the islands in terms of their internal ferry services are matters which have been quite rightly the preserve of those islands authorities the extent to which you'd like to see further support from the Scottish Government is rightly a discussion between those uh, parties involved and it may be it depends I suppose on how the budget discussions go that further progress can be made in relation to that but that would be for the cabinet secretary for finance uh, to talk about in his budget proposals and of course for the opposition parties to play a part in that to make their own suggestions and see where they can support the Scottish Government's budget. Jamie Halper Johnson. Uh, thank you for starting off. So, given the Cabinet Secretary for Finance's protestations during and since last week's ferry debate on ferry for, uh, fair ferry funding for Orkney and Shetland's internal ferries, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that it's still normal protocol for the Scottish Government to put Scottish Government commitments into the Scottish Government's own budget, rather than relying on opposition parties to do so on their behalf? Cabinet Secretary. I, I, think the, I know the member was not here at the start of this parliamentary session, but this is a minority government. This is a parliament of minorities. And in that context, just as at Westminster, people have to have discussions and sometimes even make compromises. That's why it's important that opposition parties play their full part in the budget process. And I think the implication of the question from the member is that that party want to play no part in the budget process of this parliament. That's their entitlement. But I think they will lose out, as will the local electors, for not taking part in the process. Question nine, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it's making in improving productivity across the country. Cabinet Secretary. Scotland's labour productivity has, as I've mentioned previously, outstripped the UK's in recent years. The most recent data shows that GDP per hour worked has increased by 6.6% in Scotland since 2007, compared to 0.8% for the UK. We've also improved our ranking against other OECD countries in that time. 
We believe that all areas of Scotland will make a vital contribution to improving our productivity. That's why we're working with partners across Scotland to improve our performance. For instance, we're making substantial investments in improving transport connectivity across the country. We've committed up to £1.08 billion pounds over the next 10 to, 10 to 20 years for city deals in Glasgow, Aberdeen, Inverness and Edinburgh, the biggest funder of city deals in Scotland. And we're working with other city regions to develop proposals and have committed to establishing new regional economic partnerships representing every community in Scotland. Colin Beattie. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree that without such an improvement in productivity, income levels in Scotland may well not develop to the extent we would like to see? Cabinet Secretary. I think that is true. I think improving our productivity is central to delivering sustainable and inclusive economic growth and to increasing wages and incomes across Scotland. And that's why we're taking the actions that we meant. There are vital components of increased productivity relating to innovation, to management capacity and to the skills of our workforce and to the investment the government makes. And we're trying to take action forward on all of those fronts to increase productivity. Thank you. That concludes portfolio.